Hello, this is Nina. Welcome to NV Fine Art Studio. Quite often I receive questions about how to organize the palette, what colors to use, how many, how to mix and so on. Today I want to talk about my palette and my choices of colors. I will show you every color on my palette, why I pick this particular color and where I use it. I hope this video will answer most of your questions and will guide you to fine-tune your own palette. All the examples I use today are from my Patreon demonstrations. And just in case you want to join and curious about my teaching style, the link for free demo will be over here and in the description below. I organize my colors from cool to warm, starting from the top right corner. In general, I mostly have some sort of primary colors for mixing and neutrals. I don't have greens except these two guys, cerulean and cobalt turquoise, if you can call them greens. And a few odd boards such as lavender and very pale of white color barf. I recently added two violets and I will discuss the reason later when we get to them. In general, when you compose your palette, you shouldn't think just about the color. It's best to pay attention to the pigment qualities, the tone, is it warm or cool, the value range, how dark it can get, transparency, granulation and so on. Let me show you exactly what my choices of paints are, so you can refine yours. The first one is Paints Grey by Winsor & Newton. It's quite different to all other Paints Greys. It is the most true cool blue grey in comparison to most other common watercolor paint brands. It is a very clean semi-opaque color. I usually use it if I need a transparent dark, which is a very rare occasion, such as painting a dark stormy sky or doing a value study. Honestly, I hardly ever use it nowadays, probably only for value studies, because it makes things look gloomy in your painting. The next one is Mineral Violet by Holbein. Beautiful color. I think it's based on quinacridone pigment and as all quinacridones, it is a very vibrant and I absolutely adore this quality in this pigment. I also have Carbazel Violet by Daniel Smith. It is similar but cooler and not as vigorous. I got violets only recently. I used to mix my own, still do, but I noticed that I always tend to overdo alizarin when mixing it with ultramarine to make a violet. Alizarin is a very strong color and by habit I just dip my brush as it was any other color and grab too much of it. And then I have to either live with it or start all over. And secondly, having a violet ready available saved me some time, because I noticed that recently I started to use more violets in my mixes. And also quite often I need it really quickly while the wash is very wet and runny. Just pick it up, drop it in the wash and let it mix on the paper. Basically it saves me time when I work wet on wet. This painting and all other examples in this video are taken from the full demonstration videos on Patreon. If you want to practice and see more examples where and how I use all these beautiful colors, please find me there. In general, when I make a video for Patreon, I always cover a specific topic. I want you to not only have a good time painting with me, but also take something that you can implement when you paint on your own. There are already more than 30 videos there, so there are at least 30 topics covered. I'm sure you will find something new and exciting. This is Blue Appetite by Daniel Smith. It's a gorgeous color. I really liked it when I got it, but I just couldn't find a use for this, so I never use it. And have no idea why it's still in my palette. The next one is French Ultramarine by Daniel Smith. This is a staple in every artist's palette. I used to have Ultramarine, but recently changed it to French Ultramarine. French Ultramarine is a warmer, more saturated and granulated pigment. I used to like plain Ultramarine for less granulated quality because I used it for, um, for the sky and granulation in the sky bothered me. 
um, but I really needed a dark granulating blue in my palette for everything else. So I found a way how to reduce granulation for the sky, basically mixing it 50-50 with cobalt blue. The next one is Cobalt Blue by Daniel Smith. I don't think this guy needs any introduction. It is a primary neutral blue color. Primary blue means that if you mix it with primary yellow, which is very close to cadmium yellow lemon, and or primary red, in theory you can create any color. Obviously this statement is questionable, at least for me because uh, we more than often value properties of pigments more than colors, such as value range, transparency, granulation, vibrancy. So it is definitely a good idea to practice painting just with three colors, just with three primary colors. Uh, if you're a beginner, but when you get more proficient with things, it's great fun to add a variety to your palette. And talking about variety, the next two are non-typical paints. This is Cerulean and Cobalt Turquoise. I like these guys for their opaque, staining and granulating properties. This is exactly what I was talking about when I mentioned variety. The Cerulean I use is a Windsor and Newton color, but it can be substituted by Holbein as well. They use the same PB35 pigment. Windsor and Newton is a tiny bit cooler and more granulated. I like Cerulean to paint sky near the horizon because it's a cooler blue and to create sense of depth we use cooler colors closer to the horizon. Cobalt Turquoise is by Holbein. I don't think there is any other brand that makes this particular hue. It is the most blue and vivid out of all teal colors. I use both of these paints when I paint ocean waves, sky near the horizon, for mixing greens. I particularly like it to mix with uh, raw sienna, yellow ochre, burnt sienna and uh, cadmium red light. The next color is Cadmium Lemon by Windsor & Neuron. It is very close to primary yellow but a bit cooler and it is an opaque color. In pure state I'd use it for sunrises or sunset. It adds nice and bright glow to the sky. In mixes I would use it to make greens, uh, in particular for making spring greens or sunlit greens against the light. Indian Yellow by Daniel Smith. This is basically a transparent substitution for cadmium lemon. I really like this color, it is very beautiful, vibrant and transparent. I like to use it in landscapes if I want to show a green field full of sun in the focal point. It just makes the area glow. The next one is Quinacridone Gold by Daniel Smith. This is a very vibrant and transparent color too, but much warmer in comparison to Indian Yellow. I'd use it for the same purpose as Indian Yellow, but if I need a warmer hue. Australian landscapes are yellow and brown most of the time, so this color is used much more often than Lemon and Indian Yellow. The next two are Yellow Ochre by Windsor & Newton and Raw Sienna by Holbein. I used to have Daniel Smith Raw Sienna, but it was too warm and too close to Yellow Ochre in hue. So these guys are my two options for neutrals. The warm neutral is Yellow Ochre and the cool neutral is Raw Sienna. Honestly, this is how I always think. Warm, cool, light, dark, opaque, transparent, granulating, non-granulating. I would highly advise you to do the same when you composing your palette. These two are probably my most used colors. I add them to everything. In its pure state, I use it for sky, land, water, skin color, clothing, you name it. In mixes, most often for making greens, and to neutralize blues and violets. 
The final two in this column are Burn Sienna by Winsor & Newton and Queen of Credon Sienna by Daniel Smith. These are darker neutrals. I use them for the exact purpose as raw sienna and yellow ochre, but when I need a darker neutral. So if I need something below tonal value 7. And this is what we haven't talked about just yet, the tonal values of pigments. Just a reminder that tonal values are a um, saturation or darkness of a color. Tonal values are typically divided into 10 steps, where number 1 is white and 10 is black. Light values are between 1 and 4, middle values 5 and 7, and darks are between 8 and 10. 10. So, the positive thing about burnt sienna, it can cover a large variety of values in comparison to raw sienna, somewhere from 1 to 9. Quinacridone sienna is a much more vibrant and warm hue. So, if I'm looking not just for a darker value color, but a definite presence of a warm hue in the mix, I use Quinacridone sienna. And if I need opaque substitution, I would use cadmium red light that is next in line. This probably doesn't make any sense for those who think colors, because they are so different looking colors, right? But in reality, they're both intense, vibrant, warm pigments that can go quite dark in value. Talking about cadmium red light, this is a primary color. It is an opaque and very vibrant color, and this is exactly what I use it for. In its prime state, I use it for bright red statements, such as famous trade earnings, traffic lights, red cars, tailgate lights, poppy flowers in the field, and so on. In mixes, I usually add it to blues to neutralize and make grays. I add it to yellows when I paint skies, so it doesn't turn green when overlapping with blue. I add it to greens when I want a warmer green, such as you see during sunrise or sunsets. The next one is alizarin crimson. This is a cool red. It is transparent and a very strong color. It also can be used as a dark warm. It can go up to value 9. Unfortunately, because it's so intense, I tend to always overdo it. But it is a beautiful color for making grays. If I'm about to make a big shadow that would cover half of the painting, I would definitely use alizarin in the mix. I would never substitute it with violet. It just adds this gorgeous warm glow to the shadows that I cannot substitute with any other pigment. Now I want to skip these two little odd boards here. I will talk about them later and jump straight to neutral tint. This neutral tint is from Windsor and Newton. This is definitely the gray worth mentioning. It is a warm black gray color. In its pure state from the tube it is value 10. You cannot go darker than that. It is opaque, so it's perfect for the final darkest darks in your painting. In regards to mixing, I use it to darken my warm colors. For example, if I need to transition burnt sienna from middle value range into darks, I would add neutral tint. At this point, you may think, if you have paints gray already, why not use this instead? Just a reminder, paints gray is a cool black gray. Burnt sienna and paints gray are complementary colors, like blue and orange. They will neutralize each other and make gray. But mixing light warm with dark warm makes the mix dark warm, not neutral gray. This will be relevant to all mixes that I can make from burnt sienna. For example, greens. If I want to make the green made from burnt sienna and cerulean into dark value range and keep it warm vibrancy, I will need to add neutral tint. If I add paints gray, it will turn into dull gray with a hint of green. The last two, but definitely not least, lavender and buff titanium. I think I eat breakfast, lunch and dinner with these two colors. Not a healthy thing. <laughs> Let's start with lavender. It is an opaque, warm, bluish gray. 
If you want to achieve this color by mixing, you will need the white to make it opaque, ultramarine and alizarin to make it purpley gray. In its pure state, I use it for sky, for shadows, for clothing, painting white objects in shadows. In mixes, I use it to add opacity, to lighten without adding water, to add a hazy feel to objects in distance, to take something out of focus. This is just name a few. I would probably add it to anything and everything and I will find the reason why, unless I'm definitely thousand percent sure that I don't want to add it. Buff Titanium is a semi-opaque muted light neutral paint and this is the beauty of it. It adds haziness to the mixes and it doesn't change the opacity too much. In its pure state, I use it instead of white gouache when I don't need a staccato appearance in the highlights. The bold, bright, white in your face type of thing. In the mixes, I use it instead of raw sienna when I want to softly neutralize or softly warm up the mix. For example, if I mix cerulean with raw sienna, it will turn into a vibrant green. But if I add buff to cerulean, it will make it a nice tropical aqua color that is great for painting ocean waves near the surf. Another example, I quite often add it to the warm mixture for the sky. It adds warmth and haziness to the clouds without an intense raw sienna feel that is usually associated with the late afternoon sun. Okay, this is all I have here. Sometimes I think it's more than enough. I can definitely reduce it to 10 instead of 20 colors. But I have all these wells, so I might just use it. I'm actually thinking of removing the colors that I rarely use and leaving a few empty wells to experiment with new pigments. Painting style and how you see tones and hues is always evolving and changing and it evokes a demand for new paints. I recently got these two new colors, Horizon Blue and Cadmium Orange. I'm quite happy with them. I may just make them permanent residents in my palette. I also got June from Holbein to compare with Buff, but I haven't tried it yet. I may make a comparison video actually. If you are interested, keep an eye on it. Also, I got a swatch of Cadmium Free paints from Winsor Newton. I haven't tried it yet. Yet. So again, if you are interested in my opinion, please subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss them. This is all for today. I hope it was informative and enjoyable. If so, please like, subscribe, hit that notification button, leave a comment, especially if you have any questions about the colors, pigments, palettes or anything else in regards to watercolor. And I will see you in my Patreon.